Okay, right. So, um, this talk, Flying Fast BXC in Competition, I've given it a couple of times before. Um, it's basically a talk I wrote uh, in about 2011, which is when I was flying my best. Um, I was flying a lot of two-line gliders at the time, doing competitions, doing quite well in some competitions. And these, these are basically all the secret techniques that I've used to get average speed up and get good results. It's probably the most, well, it's certainly the most advanced paragliding talk that I have or can, can give. Um, it goes into a lot of details. Um, so it's really good, scaring it up for people who want to enter competitions, want to do well in competitions, or people are flying XC and want to increase their XC distance. Um, I'm not going to cover much of the sort of basics of XC flying, um, so just be right, it's quite a high level talk. Um, I wrote it in 2011, it's been updated a few times since. I've given it the Navator Open, I've given it to the, the British uh, Paragliding Racing Academy, I've given it to the British Open in San Andre. Um, that said, this is what I wrote when I was flying my best, and I'm not flying at that level now. So it's very much a case of do as I say, not as I do now. So uh, <laughs> bear in mind. Um, okay, what I'll cover. So what I mean by flying fast, why it's important, and then of course the main part is how to actually do it. So what I mean by flying fast. Uh, this is about maximizing your average speed yeah, around a, a competition uh, task or around an XE circuit. That's that average number, your total flight distance divided by your total flight time. Um, on good days, by good days, I mean days when there are good thermals, you can be confident of finding and the next, next bit of lift. This, is, this sort of stuff is not for the scratchy days or when you're in survival mode. It's for basically hoofing around uh, and getting the big numbers. And very much competition tasks and closed circuit XC flights. So we're not talking about downwind, uh, open distance downwind. This is for mountain flying, um, where either the task, you want to get to goal, or you're doing closed circuit flight, you want to get back to your car at, uh, or complete your X contest uh, triangle at the end of the day. So it's about average speed, but a lot of the techniques I'll talk about use your speed bar in places where you wouldn't normally use a speed bar. Wouldn't can, your in the flight instructor would not recommend using your speed bar. It is you have to be f fully comfortable using the full speed range of your glider, right from minimum sink and so on, right up to full bar. And we use an analogy I like to think of is that um, the speed bar is third and fourth gear on your car. If you don't use your speed bar, you can get around driving over in first and second gear, but you're not going to get the big distances. So, how fast is fast? These are rough numbers, put out the bit at the back of my head. Um, an average beginner XC pilot will get somewhere between 15 and 20 kilometers an hour average. By the time you're a good XC pilot, you're pushing about 25 kilometers an hour on that's a 100k in four hours, roughly. Um, if you're getting 30 kilometers an hour average, this is the top end of a uh, competition. Um, this is flying 300, uh, 300k plus. Um, this is pretty special. It's a good day and a good pilot and a good glider. 35 kilometers an hour is, would get you top 10 in a top level competition. Uh, for example, just last weekend, we had the Trophy Monte Grappa um, in Bassano. There was a task of 157 kilometers. And I think the winner's average speed was 37 kilometers per hour. And I'll show you a little clip from um, Instagram of one of the switches down. So that's, but that's generally, that's pretty exceptional. Um, I'll, I'll explain why that was, that was so fast. <coughs> to put these things more in context, so if you want to fly, um, the current world speed record, not that such a thing exists as such, but I believe the fastest average um, speed flight was Neville Hewlett's first 500 kilometer flight in South Africa, where he flew for 10 hours, averaging over 50 kilometers an hour. And that is you know, certainly faster than the maximum speed of, of my ENC glider. So if I'd glided on full bar for 10 hours, I was going about the same distance without me. That's, that's the sort of level that you need for, um, for world records. And similarly, when you look at the 500k flights in Quixada in Brazil, they have simply nine, nine or 10 hours to fly. They need to have 10 hours or so uh, to fly. They would need to go really fast indeed. 
Um, why fly fast? So it's very simple. The distance that you fly is speed, your average speed times your time. In four hours of 20 hours, you get 80 kilometers. If you want to fly 200 kilometers, which is a reasonable achievable goal, I think, for uh, many of you guys, you need to be flying for eight hours at a minimum speed of 25 kilometers an hour. If you're only doing 20 k an hour, you're never going to get it. Yeah. If you want to go for the big magic numbers, like 300, we're getting a few 300 kilometers of closed circuit flights now, this is 10 hours at 30 kilometers an hour average speed. These are really long, long flights at, at high average speeds. What I find particularly interesting about this table is that the time you get to fly, the duration of, of the flying window is a function of the day. You have no real control over that. But the speed at which you fly is a function of the pilot. This you do have control over. So if you can get your average speed up, when those good days come along, those eight and 10 hour days, then you can get the really big numbers, which will get you even higher up X contests or get, get you to the front. Um, fundamentally, every, every paraglider flight when you care about distance is a race against the sun. There is limited flying day, you need to get as far as you can uh, in the time available. So that's the, the what and the why. Um, here's uh, another interesting little table. So what this, uh, these numbers show is, imagine a long ridge with a okay, cane water. Um, this is actually imagine those perfect thermals. You fly along, you hit a one meter a second thermal, then you glide at um, sort of reasonable speed, 50 kilometers an hour or so. Uh, then you hit another th thermal, you climb up in that and glide on to the next one. This shows that depending on the thermal strength, this is the sort of average speed that you'll make without wind. And this is the fraction of the time you spend climbing and a fraction of the time you spend gliding. Um, to, so, interesting things here is that to get High, um, high average speeds, we do need strong thermals, or we need to avoid using thermal altogether. And as we start to get, um, as the thermals get better on these really good days in the Alps, we spend relatively less of our time uh, climbing and more of our time gliding. And that means to get your speed up, you actually, gliding efficiently becomes very important indeed, because that's actually what you're doing for a large chunk of the time. To put these things in context, if you're just trim, uh, flying along at trim speed in just sufficient lift to, um, to stay up, so you say one, one and a half meter second lift, so it's um, sorry, zero, so you get zero because it's incorrect with your glider, your trim speed is what, 35 kilometers an hour. So just flying straight and maintaining height is as good as having two and a half meter second thermals. So flying straight is actually a very good way and staying up the to get your average speed up. And we'll talk more about that later. So how to do it? It was Mark Wagger Watts, he's been British champion, um, so I mean, he's one of the best competition pilots that the, um, the Brits have produced. And he has very simple things, just don't waste time. To put this in context, so the difference between, to get one kilometer an hour more of extra speed, that means, um, Let's say your average speed is 30 kilometers an hour, so you're, you're doing uh, a kilometer every two minutes. To, in two minutes, that's six turns in a thermal. Each turn's about um, uh, 20 seconds. So if you get to the top of the thermal and you do six extra turns as you're trying to work, work out the weak lift at the top or trying to work out whether to go or let someone else go first, you've just taken one kilometer an hour of, of your average speed. So don't waste time is be decisive in your group. Do not spend time in weak lift, etc. So that's the summary. Now this is going to the more into the details of this. Um, I'll, I'll start off with um, some technical stuff on like, how you actually handle your glider, and then after this we'll go into more uh, detail, more sort of higher level planning stuff. Um, these five things you can read between. This is what we we'll talk about for the details. So. Climb selection first. Oh, actually, so this one first. Yeah. So when we're looking at climbs, um, we tend to focus on what is the strength of, of the core. Uh, what is? Um, but what really matters is your overall average climb in a thermal. 
That includes from first coming off the bar and sort of starting to look for it, finding that core, working your way up in the thermal, occasionally falling out, and then leaving at the top. So the number you should look at is not the peak climb that you get, or your 20 second average, it's your overall average climb rate for uh, inner thermal. It includes all these different things you might be doing. And um, if you, I, I have a little program that analyzes this, and it'll calculate the climb efficiency for you. This is your overall average climb rate, that what you got in that thermal, the time you spent in it, divided by the best 20 second average climb that you, uh, you got, which is an indication of how good the thermal was. So 100% efficiency is you fly straight into that core, it's a two meters a second core, you manage two meters a second, seconds all the way to the top, and you exit. In practice, um, if, you, if you use the IGC to KMZ converter, which you get on Leonardo, it includes this sort of analysis. Um, what I've, I've found in practice, that anything over 80% is actually very good indeed. It's quite hard to get, even when you think you've got a perfect straight into the core thermal out, you get about 80%. 70% is, is normal, and anything less than 70% is, is not great. It means either the lift is, is broken and weak and it's hard to maintain a, a decent climb, or you're wasting time in the thermal. And this, it's this overall average uh, climb rate, once again, that matters. Um, and this, this will affect some of, some of the decisions you make. So, climb selection. One of the first things I do when we know, we know that we know that we need strong climbs to, to fly fast. On well, my first thermal out of launch, at as, as I climb up, I'm, I'm measuring or monitoring how the climb rate varies with altitude. Uh, for example, is it weak, low down? Is there an inversion? Is there other layers in there that are particularly good or bad? And then this gives me an overall view of. The, 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 strength, the, the strength of thermal as a function of altitude. Um, once I've built that model, I will set, set a threshold for the day. Um, this will adapt, but basically, I will say I will not stop for anything less than one meter a second worse than the best thing I got at that altitude. So if I've had a three meter a second climb out of launch, I want to find at least two meters before uh, I will even consider stop and turning. That, and by not even consider, that means fly straight through anything that's not going to give you that. And to do that, you need to know your, the performance of your glider on speed bar, uh, what its sync rate is. So that you can know you can be on half bar, you know your sync rate is 2.2 meters per second, so that when your average vario says you're now only get, you're going 0.7 meters per second uh, down, you know you're in a thermal because you're in a 1.5 meter thermal. Um, and you need to be able to you set this threshold and you can make these decisions without coming off the bar or changing direction. When you're looking for thermals, search on speed bar. When you're on speed bar, you're typically going 30 to 50 percent faster than your average, your, your trim speed. Your trim speed is 35, your top speed is say 45, 50 kilometers an hour, so that's 20 or 30 percent more speed. That means in any given moment, you cover 30 or 40% more air. And you'll find that next thermal quicker, simply because you're searching um, more air more quickly. And that, the search means that you're more likely to find a better core, and it more than compensates for the extra sink rate that you get um, from flying on bar. One of the classic things that I've certainly been guilty of, I'm sure everyone is guilty of, is you like, you'll glide on speed bar between thermals, but when you think you're coming to another thermal, because you've seen uh, people climbing, for example, you tend to come off the speed bar early, go onto the brakes and go into search mode. You're sort of ready for the, um, the thermal. Yeah. So stay on the bar, and I'll talk a little bit about thermal entry in a moment. <coughs> search the largest, strongest core first. This is another thing to make it easy for yourself. When you have a, th a thermal, um, I'm going to it's w when you first hit a thermal, you're hitting the stuff around the edge, which is rarely the strongest stuff. So when you hit that thermal, you keep searching, you keep going through to try and find the largest, largest biggest core. Do not turn the first thing you come across, because if you hit something, there's probably something better there as well. 
and you've already hopefully built this model of the day of like, I know the three milliseconds of climb around, uh, climbs around. So when I hit something on the edge, I'm not going that, I want to find a good three meter in the middle. And very simply, the bigger the thermal, the easier it is to climb in. It's much easier to find that big core and then do nice circles and that than have to work some bitty scrappy lift around the outside. Um, prefer signs over triggers and sources. So um, what I mean by this is um, other gliders basically <coughs> pimp off other gliders climbing. It's, it's the, the best thermal indicator there is. And given a choice between a bunch of pilots uh, thermaling somewhere and somewhere I think is going to have a fantastic thermal on it, I will tend to go for the pilots simply because with a large number of thermal markers, you can search much more air between you and you're much more likely to, um, to find the, the good climb. Um, there's a saying in competitions that the gaggle never goes down. It does happen occasionally, but very rarely. And it normally, uh, even in the weakest conditions, pilots spreading out, looking for lift, working together, um, always, always works. Thermal entry now. So we're tracking along on our speed bar. We're searching, we're flying through the edge of the thermal now on speed bar. When we hit that thermal, um, where there's going to be turbulence around. You're going to be controlling the pitch of your glider on the speed bar. Not on the brakes, because that's slow. If you're flying through terminals, you want to be on speed bar. When the glider goes back, push wall bar. When the glider pitches forwards, release the bar. This is a really good thing to practice when you have um, altitude. Um, but your, your pitch control on the bar is, is massively more efficient than, um, than doing it on the brakes. When you hit a thermal, the glider pitches back. What you want to do is actually push more bar to get the glider to bite into the thermal and keep it above your head. The, um, and then you only release the speed bar once you're actually in the core of the thermal. And you, know, you should know you're in the core either because it matches what you expect to find, or you've seen other pilots circling there and you assume that they're in the core. Um, there's a nice video from Rita Riser, let's see if this works. So this is um, a Swiss flight Rita Riser, he liked playing around with his wing, and this, is, this shows you how much height you get when you convert. When you release that bar in the core, it's going to full speed here, and he raises, he's gaining 10 meters or so on an on a END wing. So, um, this, that 10 meters of extra height doesn't sound like very much on its own, but it has, you spend less time in the sink and bad stuff, you spend more time in the core. In competitions, particularly, a lot of it, competitions are not about being as fast as possible, competitions are about being first, even if you're slower. And 10 meters of extra altitude puts you a little bit higher than the other pilots and puts you in a position of control. So and if you can do this, if you hit 10 thermals uh, on the course and you get 10 meters in every one, that's an extra 100 meters of altitude, which means when on that final glide, you're gonna be 100 meters higher than the person not doing this, you'll leave first, you'll get the win. Um, Ross Ogden taught me this one many years ago and he's, yeah, it's, it's impressive to watch. He comes in full speed, releases off the bar, it pitch, the glider um, climbs up, he converts that, that speed into a nice turn. He's in his way in the, in the core. Um, thermaling itself. So now we're in the thermal. So a golden rule here is that the strength of the thermal is way more important, or the strength of the lift you're in is way more important than your turn efficiency. It is way better to turn inefficiently in good lift than it is to turn efficiently in bad lift. This means when there's a small bullet thermal, you want to really crack it over. And it's more important to stay in, in that core, even if you're swinging out, um, doing a sharp turn, than it is to do a more gentle turn. Um, when you're, you really want to maximize that amount of time you're spending in that strong lift. It's very interesting watching um, Krugel Maurer fly. I'm flying with him uh, in a, actually, I've seen the back of him in a few competitions. And he uses the full speed range of the glider in the thermals. And when there's, particularly if the thermals are small um, and not really big enough to turn in, 
when he hits a core, all the brakes come really on. It goes almost down to minimum speed of the glider uh, to maximise the amount of time that he's spending in that uh, in that core. And he outclimbs one as a result of this. So and the golden rule really for the thermaling is never be satisfied with the lift that you're in. Always, always be looking for something better. Always be watching other pilots. They're the best, um, the best indicators that there are. Um, things to look for. The better the, the thermal, the more cranked over the pilot will be. So by looking at their angle of bank, that gives you an idea of what, what sort of thermal strength they are. Um, if you think someone is climbing better than you, they almost certainly are. And in which case you should go straight full bar over to their core immediately. If they've got an extra metre a second than you, and they do one extra turn, they get 20 metres more than you. Just like that. So um, what I tend to do is, if I'm, while I'm working my own bubble, I'm also watching all of the other gliders around me. I'm trying to see who's popping up, who's coming up into my field of view. And if I see that, I will go and join them. If you see someone else climbing well, then there's a good chance that even when you're going to reach them, you'll go through the middle of the thermal and you'll hit something even better on the way. But as soon as you see someone climbing well, move directly to them. Yeah. Keep your wing movements smooth. What you want to do is build a mental model of how the, the sort of the, where the cores are in this, this thermal. What, um, is it a, sh a sharp bullet core with weak stuff around, and sinking weak around, or is it a larger thing with more gentle cores? <coughs> and you can only do that if you, um, if you can identify what's coming from your, in your inputs and, and the air. And if your inputs are wild and your wings all over the place, then it's very hard to work out what's you waggling the wing around and what, what's the air. So the smoother you can keep your wing movements, the better. The, the smooth wing movements also make the, the, the glider much more efficient. If it's pitching all over the place, it just, it's not, just not aerodynamically efficient. Um, know which direction to search. Um, so on a null wind day, thermals are roughly round. But when there's wind, that thermal, as it's rising up, it has, um, has inertia. And the wind tends to blow around the thermals. And it tends to blow away the weaker lift effect. And that tends to mean that on a, a windy day, the best cores are on the upwind side of the thermal. And that makes a difference if you know this when you hit that thermal. If I'm, if I have a, um, if I'm flying downwind and I hit a thermal, I probably hit the core immediately. But if I'm flying upwind and I hit a thermal, then I probably want to continue searching all the way to the upwind edge of the thermal. If, it's, if, I think I've, if I'm going crosswind, I will probably want to turn into the wind to be in my search. I'm more likely to find the, the, the core on the, um, on the upwind side. You need to be quite aggressive, I would say, in get it staying in that best lift. If you fall out of a core, core you want to get straight back into it. As soon as your vario uh, starts indicating the lift is weakening or you feel it, doo -doo 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 -doo, turn immediately and really fight for every, every metre. It can be quite easy to say, oh, I missed the core, okay, I guess I go round and, and uh, search for it and try and find it again. <clears throat> be aggressive, just the don't waste time. You want to get yourself right back in that, that best lift immediately, even if it means doing a sharp turn. It's well worth it because you, you get back in the core quicker. Thermal exit. So there's stuff to be gained here as well. The first thing to do is while you're thermaling, plan what your next move is going to be. Um, look, um, if, if you're flying um, either, either competition, you'll have a defined task, so you know which direction you want to go next. If you're flying big XC, then you will definitely, you'll also have planned your, uh, your flight ahead of time, and you'll have a rough, uh, or you should know exactly which direction you're flying in. Uh, flight planning is one of the secrets to getting big, big flights. Um, it means you can fly with intent and purpose and you eliminate a lot of um, time wasted working out where shall I go next. Um, the other secret to flying big XC is fly in places you know and fly lots of sections and then join them together on the big days. Um, so what this means when you get to the top of the thermal you should know exactly where you're going next. And be decisive. 
When you decide to leave the thermal, just leave it and go. You see it a lot, particularly with um, beginner XC pilots. They'll climb up in a thermal, they'll be uh, over the teeth, and they'll think, shall I go, oh, I'll just do a few more turns, and now they're just turning in the weak stuff at the top. They all fail, oh, finally I will go, and they leave the thermal, they nearly hit the sink on the other side. They go, oh no, that was too much sink, so they go back into the thermal and back up again. Just wait that way so much time. Don't do that. Just be decisive, know where you're going next, and go immediately. Cross the thermal when exiting. You're typically doing circles. To finish that, finish your turn, basically do a tight turn on the opposite side of the thermal to where you want to go. So you then cross straight through the middle of the thermal um, to get extra little bits of lift there. Apply the speed guard before exiting the thermal. Um, there's uh, a safety reason for this and a speed reason for this. Um, the speed reason is very simple. Thermals typically have sink or turbulence around them. And if you're already on the bar, you're going to spend less time in that, in that sink and um, rough stuff around. The safety reason is that um, particularly when there's clouds, we've got, um, so the lift goes up into the cloud and then it sort of falls off down the side. That means you exit the thermal while the air is still going up, as opposed to an inverted, inverted day where you take the thermal all the way to the top of the, uh, to, to, the uh, to its top. That means there's often air go uh, there's a a vertical shear layer with air going up in the thermal and air descending on side. When you exit, the classic thing is you get a frontal uh, collapse on your glider, um, which typically you would do, you would damp down by your planting on the brakes. The much better way to do it is you're on speed bar and then you release the speed bar. And this has the same effect as, um, as damping the, the brakes to prevent the frontal, but it's just much, much, much more efficient. So is that a question? Oh. Okay. I, I have one question that yeah. is maybe not entirely related to this, but when you get on bar mm -hmm. and you go off bar, do you have like a specific way to do it? Because I found that sometimes if I go too fast, obviously the wind shoots. Yeah. And I found like a double step, like if I push half bar or half as to where I want to go, and then as it starts shooting, then push the rest. Yeah. That works a bit better. Do you have like something you use specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, generally want to put the bar on gently. I mean, if the wing's being pitched forwards or backwards, you can be quick in your movements to keep the wing above your head. But yes, you're right. You need to basically do a gradual application of the speed bar. If you just slam it on, the wing will dive forward. Then you have to um, fix that, that pitch movement. But yeah, but putting on over two or three seconds is, is fine. Um, just one yeah. follow-up then. Yeah. So when you say go to bar, yeah. how much? Because uh, you um, have, have some control. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. So it depends a bit on your glider. Um, as a rough rule of thumb, if you're on an ENB glider, every glide you should be flying roughly a third bar. If you're on an ENC glider, you should be at least half bar. And if you're on an END or CCC glider that have much higher performance, even at high speeds, then you're three quarter of the bar. So you want uh, basically as, not, as much speed as possible, um, but still with some in reserve so you can compensate for, um, for the active pitch, uh, but not so much that your glider performance really starts to suffer. Um, if you look at the polar curves for gliders, there's um, beyond, depending on which glider it is, beyond a certain point, you'll get speed, but your, your glider really suffers, and you want to basically go to that point. So what, what I'm usually doing there is I try to, to optimize uh, basically my glide number. Mm -hmm. is, is that a good idea? Or, I mean, sometimes if you have strong thermals, I, I believe that even uh, a worse plan, a glide number could be overcompensated by speed or not so, so much. Uh, can you explain? Yeah, yeah for example, like if, I, if I go without speed bar, I, might, I may have, have like an 8 climb yeah. climb number, and then I go to speed bar, I may even go up a little bit to 9, 10, and yeah. then if I push it even more, I go faster, so I'll yeah. be quicker at the next thermal, but the glide number goes down back to like 7. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm trying always, like I push the speed bar in a way that I try to optimize my glide. Is that th the that's thing? not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, this is uh, McCready's speed to fly theory. Basically, um, which I don't actually cover in this talk, because I kind of assume everyone's come across it, but I'll give a quick mm -hmm. recap. So. Speed to fly, um, it basically answers the question, how fast should I fly to the next thermal? 
and it turns out you have basically um, two extreme options. Option number one is you fly slowly, which gives you a good glide, and you arrive at the thermal late, but high. Or you fly fast, which gives you worse glide, you arrive at the thermal earlier, but lower down. The, which one is best, or which where between that, depends on the strength of the next thermal and the performance of your glider. So uh, typically on weekdays, where the thermal, well, when the thermals are weak, you want to glide slowly, so you arrive high but late because you then go spend a lot of time. On strong days, um, then it's much better to arrive lower, but the thermal of thermal is going to compensate for that. Um, uh, as a rough guy, you, th the other thing with the speed fly theory is that it indicates that you're penalised much less for flying too fast than too slow. Mm. So it really depends on the day what you should be doing. And that pure glide number over the ground is not, is not what you should be carrying out. What you care about is how quickly can I get to the top of the next thermal. Mm -hmm. um, there's another aspect of speed to fly, uh, which is not very useful for XC, but is for competition. That is, um, I'm in thermal, I want to cross the finishing line. So I'm going to have to climb up to a certain height and then glide to cross that finishing line. I have two extreme choices. I can leave the thermal early and then glide slowly but well and make it the line. Or I can climb higher in the thermal, spend more time in the thermal and then glide faster. Um, so once again, depending on the performance of your glider and the thermal strength, McCready's speed to fly theory will tell you um, basically what altitude you should leave that thermal to get over the, the finishing line as quick as but XC pilots, we tend to fly to get more about getting as far as possible, and that means getting to the top of the next climb as, as soon as possible. Does that answer your mm -hmm. question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so thermal instant release, Myron turbulence in the shear, that your glider is actually very hard to collapse in that configuration. Um, and of course, you're at the bar, and then once you've, I'm um, sorry, when so you're going to go front towards, you release the bar, you can go straight back on the bar as soon as you'll pass through the shear. Okay, we saw earlier that as the thermals get stronger, we're going to spend more time gliding. And gliding well actually becomes an important part of your, your overall performance. Um, and I, I find it quite funny that um, people tend to buy paragliders based on claimed glide performance. But this is really something where, in theory, the pilot doesn't have much effect. It's the one thing the pilot doesn't really control. But, uh, yeah. So the first thing to do for gliding well is to reduce drag, uh, particularly as if you're gliding at speed. Basically, the drag goes up with the square of the speed, roughly. So small differences in drag have, or small increases in drag have much more negative consequences the faster you fly. I have three positions that I, I have. Um, on the Alpina, I've got um, toggles on the seas, or like a loop on the seas. So in normal sort of turbulent conditions where I'm worried about, I want to actively fly the glider, I will have my hands behind the risers, and I will um, have my fingers in the, uh, in the loops, and I will control inputs by giving short, sharp um, inputs on, on the sea risers. Um, if the conditions are smoother, and I need less active flying to keep the liner, I will bring my hands down and I will just put my fingers at the bottom of the risers, of the, the sea risers, and I can still steer a little bit this way, but it's once again less out of my You release the brake toggles anyway, right? Yeah, I tend is they're long enough that I can have them around my hands still, but you can release the brake toggles as well. Yeah. It's you're pulling down the riser as well as the, I mean, the whole thing is coming down. So. Is this because the seas are more efficient to steer with? Yeah, on, on, the, on the higher class wings, the sort of rear riser steering makes a, ma a massive difference. So um, I'll come back to that in a second, actually. And the final position I have is if it's smooth air, um, I lie back in my harness, I cross this called the coffin position, I cross my hands over my chest, and I get as much as me out of the, the wind as I can. Coffin position sounds promising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you prefer, you can also put your hands at the side like this, um, but I find the coffin is very quick to get back up to the brakes if needed. Um, so, yeah, so gliding. So when you're gliding on, on bar, 
you do not want to use bar and brakes at the same time. What this tends to do is that the, uh, the, the bar brings down the front of the wing, the brakes bring down the tail of the wing, and this gives a lot of camber in the aerofoil, and it makes it much more likely to collapse. So when you're on bar, you should generally be doing active flying either by using the rear risers or by playing with the bar itself. Don't use bar and brakes at the same time. What's particularly effective with two-line gliders um, is that um, the Bs, now the back risers, and the bar basically just control the angle of the aerofoil. So the aerofoil stays the same, and you're just changing this angle of attack. And whether you do that by pushing more uh, speed bar and bringing down the aims, or um, pulling on the Bs, so releasing the speed bar is the same, pulling the Bs is the same as releasing the speed bar. So two line gliders are particularly effective here because you keep that great aerofoil section and you have excellent control over the full span and uh, angle attack of the wing. Um, on three and four line gliders, like all of us here are flying, the effect is much less, but it's still present. You know, the Alpina flies well on the seas, but um, um, I, don't, I don't think uh, B, B gliders do so well. Okay. Control pitch with the bar. Um, it's much more efficient than, than the brakes. Um, you're deforming the aerofoil less. You know, when you put the brakes on, there's a whole scoop at the back. Um, when, you, um, when you're gliding, slow down in lift, so you spend more time in that lift. If you, even if something's not worth turning in, because you know, you've set your threshold for the day, uh, just coming off the bar, spending a few it means you spend a few more seconds in that lift. It can, it's particularly useful in competitions because it tends to, although it slows you down, you get more altitude, and that gives you a more commanding position over the, over, over the pilots. Um, people just charging ahead on full bar, that'll arrive quickly, but it'll be the people, uh, the, sort of the second mouse that gets the cheese, that's be these people who've slowed down a little bit of lift, now got the high, still good glide, higher position, will be able to see where the lift is and just go and pimp off, off the people in front. So, slow down in lift, but don't turn. Um, or, speed up. So, if your goal is to reach a certain point, you want to reach the finishing line, um, for example, or make it over a ridge uh, quickly, then um, if there's lift, that means we can fly at a higher speed and maintain altitude. Basically, it compensates the increasing rate with high speed. So, a good example of where you would use this is uh, if there's um, good cloud suck, a uh, cloud suck, for example. So, with cloud suck, you can be very weak, low down, but as you get closer to the cloud, it, the lift can get very strong indeed. And if you get too close, the lift can be too strong. Low down, say it's one or two meters a second, fine. There's a band of say three meters a second lift, and when you get the cloud itself, it's four or five meters a second, and it's hard to stay out of the cloud. What you can do here is flying under the cloud, you use your speed bar to control your altitude. If you slow down, your sink rate improves, so you go up. If you apply more speed, your sink rate gets worse, so you come down. And so you can fly straight line under clouds here. As soon as you get too close to the cloud, you push more bar. If you start dropping out the bottom of the, the clouds up when you lift off the bar. Does that make sense? So I think yeah, yeah. Um, so this, um, particularly on um, the long XC flights when we're flying down ridges, I'll talk about large, about large scale lift um, a bit later on. Um, this is a very effective technique for flying straight, so very efficient, flying fast. Glide straight. This is a really simple one, and uh, uh, very much a mistake that, that uh, new XC pilots tend to make. When you're a beginner XC pilot, you're, always, you're generally very worried about finding the next thermal, the second thermal, or, or the next thermal. So you tend to go and search everything. Oh, the clouds starting to form over there. I'll go and try it out. That might trigger. I'm going to fly over there. If you fly this sort of zigzaggy path, if you add 10% of extra distance, you've basically taken off a point of glide. And you see the, the top competition pilots, they fly in straight lines to the next one. There's a great story from the, the world to Mexico a few years ago. Um, uh, the top British woman, woman or top 
pilots, a lass called Kirsty Cameron, and she went out two weeks before the competition to scope out the area, sort of uh, learn every thermal and so on. And the rest of the British team, including Russ Ogden, um, arrived a, um, uh, uh, just before the start of the competition, and Kirsty said, out to Russ and said, look, I know the area, do you want to see? I'll show you where all the thermals are. And so Russ said, no, I'm just going to follow the arrow. And that's really is. If you look at the competition tracks, they're straight, and that's efficient. And glide fast. I mean, we touched this with the chat about speed to fly earlier, but basically it's well worth going. You're much better off going fast than slow. Tom, there was a theory here in 50 ways to fly better that uh, on a day with lot of, lots of cumulus and when in flat land, mm -hmm. the lift tends to go around in hexagons. Yeah. How does that work exactly? I mean, if you still fly straight, eventually you'll hit the next climb. But uh, is this... I, does, yeah. does this change in, in some, some conditions? I um, haven't seen any good evidence for that, that theory, basically. <laughs> I also yeah. think, if I understand correctly, that only applies to pure flatland flying. Yeah. Like as soon as there's ridges or bulges or any unevenness in the terrain, I think the theory collapses. I yeah, I think it was uh, flatland, and when you have uh, one of these cloud highways, mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. you don't always have to fly straight, but kind of if you lose yeah. weight uh, height, you just move left right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, finding lifty lines. Lifty lines are magic. You can get on a lifty line, it can massively improve your glide. Um, the, these, uh, they, there are a few different things that can trigger them. Um, I have a few random theories which I have little evidence to support. But um, a classic one would be, for example, conical hill convergence, which is a well-known thing. You have some hill in the wind, the wind goes round each side and then sort of rejoins behind. And that tends to um, the, the, this convergence then doesn't actually mean that that's actually mechanical convergence going up, but it just means that it's a little bit easier for the thermals to, to go up along that line. So here we have a line that's aligned with the wind. So um, lifty lines, they're usually either parallel to the wind, so uh, aligned with the wind or perpendicular to it. An example of a lifty line that might be perpendicular to um, the wind is wave effect. For example, we get this off the Jura, all of stuff hits, hits the Jura, it starts bouncing up and down, and you have lines of lift which are perpendicular to the wind direction. Um, sorry, to, find them. Yeah. to find these things, you need to be very sensitive to your glider. You want to um, very much, uh, you need to learn how your glider reacts. Does it, um, is it one that gets naturally drawn into lifty lines or does it get naturally pushed out? Um, you need to almost close your eyes and just feel what the glider's doing. And that the way to get this is to spend a lot of hours flying, Peter. Are these always like in Lee or? Not necessarily, like wave is not necessarily in Lee. They can move up. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, the, way, the way to really see them is the next time you're flying with people, try and spread out the you know, 50 meters aside and just watch how other people are doing. And you can see massive differences in glides, not because the gliders are different is because people are on different lines. And um, if you see good uh, lift the line, you pull a collapse so nobody comes to you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. The other day I was, I was flying uh, in a thermal and going up a little bit. A friend of mine who was uh, below me and uh, wanted to fly to a certain next point. We were yeah. like, okay, there's got to be a thermal. And at some point he just he couldn't get up so he just started going over there and i was like yeah well it's not gonna make it i mean yeah. it's way too low the glide never is gonna be enough and that's why he just didn't go down and then i followed him and the whole way to the next thermal was just this zero sink and I was like, yeah why and it's so hard to to see yeah yeah i mean it happens if it's going up but take it it's uh, uh, yeah but you don't know before a lot of times right no yeah. no um Look for visual clues, um, typically other gliders. Try to work out how the air is flowing through the terrain. It's particularly important to mountain uh, conditions. We're all very familiar with the um, water flowing through a stream analogy. It's relevant. It's, yeah. I'd mentioned the conical hill convergence um, earlier, but um, there are other, 
other effects that might uh, that might mean stuff is more buoyant than whatever else. Um, as well as working out whether air is going up, it's equally important to work out where air is likely to be sinking and stay out of those areas. So make sure you're considering both sides of the equation. They often define lifty lines, so you need to be safe, um, very sensitive to them, um, and you need to basically generally ease your way into them. It's very quick, e quick, easy to lose them. But if you find yourself on a bad line, get off it quickly. And that means if you're suddenly you're gliding, you're suddenly getting three meter a second sink, turn 45 degrees, get off that line, try and find something better immediately. Sink is very quickly penalizing. Yeah. 10 seconds in three meter a second is, uh, sink is 30 meters lost already. A minute in three meter a second sink is 180 meters lost. How does that go with your straight lines then? Because how do you know if it's just a perpendicular sink zone and it's just going to slow you down and you should just go straight? Or well, it's, you, a it's a judgment call you have to make. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good point you raised there. One of the, um, if you find yourself gliding badly, it's either headwinds or sink or both. And it's worth trying working out which it is. Um, and that might affect your, your strategy as a result. If there's a headwind and you need to go in that way, there's not much you can do about it. You just need to suck up that you can have a poor glide. If it's sink that's causing you to glide badly, maybe there's a better line you can take. And if it's headwinds and sink, well, turn around and fly the other way. But Nice. When you do the 45 degree turn to the yeah. right, how yeah. long do you stick to that direction before you like, make, it, make another change? Because I find myself, and that's why Tan is looking at me when you talk yeah. about sink, that yeah. I feel like I'm almost thermally in the sink. Like I keep on going a bit <laughs> to the left, a bit to the right, a bit to the left, and I end up just flying a massively long line through sink. Yeah. yeah. Um, how long do you stay, like I'm flying um, and I get some sink, and I, like after a couple of seconds on bar, I realize this isn't getting better, and then yeah. I like, kind of get to this panic reaction where I turn to the right and I keep on flying like after 10 seconds I turn to the left again because it's <laughs> not working. Yeah. How do you know when to stop? How to just keep well, on going or whether you're... It's, a judge, it's going to depend on the day, okay. right? I mean, um, the, the best thing to have is, is other visual clues around other gliders so you can see who's doing well and, and badly. And if you've got that, great. That's kind of easy. Otherwise, it's your call. I mean, if you, were, if you think, if you understand where the sink is coming from, then you can probably work out weekly where it isn't. If it's just sinky there, then you want to get up it basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that sort of covers the sort of detailed mechanics of um, the sort of micro optimizations of flying your glider like this. Searching on bar, coming off the speed bar only when you're in the core, um, crossing the core in, um, when you exit, this sort of thing. Now I take a step back and look, look at more um, sort of larger level effects and a more sort of overall strategy to the flight. And this particular one was really one that really opened um, the big distances up to me. Our traditional model of uh, a paragliding cross-country flight is that we take a thermal up, then we glide, then we find another thermal, we take that one up and we glide. And we have this model of individual isolated thermals that we join together. What makes a massive difference is instead of seeing individual thermals, consider large areas of lift, fly straight through these, straight through these lifts, so maintain your altitude in this area, and then at the end of this large area of lift, just take enough height to be able to connect to the next one. Examples of this large-scale lift are cloud suck. Any big cloud is you know, sucking nicely. You fly, can fly into it, basically cross it under the cloud and just climb up at the far side in the direction you want to go. Um, another example of large-scale lift is ridge lift. Um, we, if you're flying along the Jura and there's a southerly wind, you know, basically the whole ridge is going to be working. There is no point stopping to take every thermal uh, that you come on call. Um, yeah. Uh, there are other effects like wave as well gives you large scale lift. Uh, okay. So the strategy then becomes uh, when you're in a the thermal, you only want to climb high enough 
that when you then fly to the area of large scale lift, you can connect with the, the lift band, basically. Um, then you fly straight along it. There's a really nice, this is a video from uh, Damien Lacaz in the, um, from this 157k task from um, the Trophy Monte Grappa last weekend. Mm -hmm. This is what modern high speed racing looks like. You can look how much speed bar he's got on. He's about, this is an Enzo 3, and he's flying about 90% bar, about just a few meters above the ground. He actually wants to get up here, so, but he's flying, controlling this, the pitch on the B's here, which is called the speed bar. Firstly, I don't want to do this. this is, I find this a bit too scary. Yeah. So he's telling himself to, it's a bit scary, he's trying to keep himself cool. And so, just pause that. So what we have here is this whole ridge, there's lift all the way along it. And he's not stopping to take a thermal here, he's going to fly to the end of the ridge and then just get enough of the thermal to get onto the next, next ridge. And this is fast, I mean this is how you get really high average speeds. Hopefully for us, this will be following cloud streets, um, particularly if you're flying somewhere like Fiche and the upper Gons Valley, if you can get on the back ridge, the high mountains, you can fly pretty much straight along it on a good day. Uh, okay. Isn't he losing because he's like in the weak group down there? It's, so it's, uh, that's a very good point. Yes, yeah, certainly these people are certainly doing better. Yeah. Um, and he wants to get that, that high. Uh, but he's already in the lead gather at this point, there's not many fighters ahead of them. So he's, he's got 120 pilots behind him, so he's doing okay. So it's faster to just... It's kind of, yeah, yeah. But it's a... The, the, these, are, these ones are doing much, say much better. They're both higher, they're in the better lift. That means they can either fly faster and maintain their altitude, or they may also have control over him. They can see if he makes a move, they can react to it. He can't react to any moves that these people make. Is he also pushing more asymmetrically? Uh, I doubt it. Um, the, um, there's quite a lot of, well, here it's down to half bar or so, so much, but generally not. It's asymmetric use of the speed bar is good for adjusting your course when you're on a long glide, but it's not a very efficient way of turning. Um, with the uh, B rise control, this is much more efficient for steering. Uh, it's, both the, it's more precise, quicker inputs. So, um, for steering on, on glide, you, you hopefully you've set up yourself on your next target and you can just weight shift or pull a little bit of riser on one side or the other to, uh, to steer. So, I mean, it's totally exciting to scope of this talk, but yeah. this is not very safe. What, is the, what are the risk implications of this? Well, I haven't heard of any um, <laughs> accidents. Okay. It's just very scary. Um, <laughs> it's, the risk is not coming through. <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> if you had a frontal at that speed, I guess you you can't get into the fact that that's smooth air, but I mean, yeah. you're not high enough up to do anything. At well, that but there's one theory that says you should fly either high enough that you can throw your reserve, or low enough that it doesn't matter if you don't mind falling a couple of meters. <laughs> okay. So, and it's, it's in between. That's the danger zone. Um, the, the, but in practice, these. These sort of racing wings, these Enzo 3s and 2 liners, mm -hmm. are incredibly collapse resistant, particularly when flown by an experienced and current pilot. Mm -hmm. the, you have the, the, um, the shark nose profiles, the B riser steering, it gives you massive, massive control um, of the glide. And collapses are actually very rare. And there's a good reason for that. I mean, collapses are slow. If you want to build a machine that's going to win your race, you want it to be fast, and you don't want to have the pilot mm -hmm. spending all the time. Uh, uh, dealing with collapses. Also, um, another interesting effect is that the faster you go, the stronger the turbulence needs to be to cause collapse. And the reason for that is that your um, the collapse is caused by a change in the angle attack of the air, basically. The air, yeah. And your, your speed through the air, if I'm flying at, say, 10 meters per second, 36 kilometers an hour, um, and I hit one meter a second thing, I'm getting a, I've got 10 forward and one meter upwards difference. So um, that's, a, that's a, whatever, 10% a a change, rough, very roughly. If I'm flying at full bar, say 15 meters per second, 
then it's one, uh, the ratio is 1 15th, and it's only two-thirds of the angle of attack change. So the faster you go, the stronger the turbulence needs to be to cause the same angle of attack change. So speed to a certain extent is, certain extent is safety. Of course, if you do have a collapse at high speed, your kinetic energy goes up to the square of your speed and things get, can get very interesting indeed. Um, but th these, this is, is pretty much fine, what they're doing here. So I talk about so large scale lift and climb up at the end to connect with the next area of the lift. Altitude selection. This is another very important one for um, getting the most out of the day. Once again, our conventional model is thermals have the same strength. We glide, glide to a point thermal, we climb up a certain speed, and then we glide on to the next one. On any given day, the strength of the climb will vary a lot with altitude and wind speed. So classic examples of this are on a normal day, it's weak, low down, it's good in the middle, and it might get weak close to the cloud. Um, in this case, you want to fly in that good middle range you don't want to get too low and get to the weak stuff. And equally, you don't want to waste time climbing in weak stuff close to the cloud. If, there is, if there's cloud suck, then the, weak, the lift is typically weak down but gets much stronger closer to the cloud. And then you want to fly high. If there are inversions, then you'll get individual convective cells between each sort of set of inversion layers. Um, and near the close to the inversion, the lift will be at its strongest, but just above an inversion, it will be at its weakest. So, Big high is not always the best. You know, you can waste a lot of time trying, to, particularly on blue days, or if the, the cumulus are very small and wispy, it's almost never worth climb, climb, trying to climb all the way to, to cloud base. Example of wind um, direction changing with altitudes, valley winds as well versus meteor winds. It's entirely normal that you'll have at altitude a northerly uh, meteor wind, but a low altitude in the valley, a westerly valley wind. So depending on which direction you want to fly, you might fly high if you want to go south and use northern, or you might fly low if you're flying, you want to fly up the valley. And I've actually seen this in competition with people on final glides um, coming into um, doing it with the valley wind, uh, downwind glide to, to goal. I've seen people do big ears to actually get them down lower into the valley wind where it's stronger to get them to goal first. It seems crazy doing big ears on final glide, but you know it actually makes sense. And our glide at paragliders is slow. You know, our normal speed's 35, our top speed's 45 or 50 if the gliders we're flying here. And wind is often 10, 15, 20 kilometers an hour. It's a large chunk of your total glider speed. And the difference between being on a, say, a CCC wing flying into a 15 kilometer headwind or an ENB wing with a 15 kilometer tailwind. I think the NB will probably do better. So you, what you need to look at here is that you choose your altitude, you choose where you fly your route so that the wind is on your side. This, um, or at least you avoid, avoid the worst of it. There's a um, very interesting example that I've seen some, um, in some places you get very reliable wind patterns set up and um, Sorry, some places where you'll get um, basically sea breeze type effects near lakes. And people do hot air ballooning where the hot air balloon returns to the start. Normally hot air balloons just go downwind, but they'll take off, they use wind direction going one way, and they rise into another layer coming back the other way, and they can then land back where they started. So take advantage of when you're planning your, your big XCs. Um, take advantage of local wind effects. So one of the things you'll notice is that almost all the big triangles, I think all the big triangles, they start in the middle of the mountains, they fly out, in the, out of the mountains in the morning, then maybe along some long ridges, and then back into the mountains at the end of the day. And the reason is valley winds. If you, this way, you start, you fly out of the mountains uh, in the morning when the valley winds are weak, you then fly your long leg Oh, well, the conditions are strong, and at the end of the day, use the valley winds to help you get back, back to your starting point and close your triangle. If you start at the edge of the mountains and then fly into them for your flight and then try to fly back out, when you're flying back out, you'll have the valley winds against you and it'll be a lot, lot harder. Use your attention wisely. So we have 
we all have a limited amount of time that we can fly and, and concentrate. And particularly if you want to fly big XEs, 150, 200K, you're looking at spending um, six to eight hours in the air, and you cannot fly at 100% for six eight, or eight hours. You need to give yourself breaks. And so you often need to do this actively. And this means that you, while you're, for example, while you're in the thermals, this is you're concentrating hard on the thermal to maximize your climb, you're planning your next move, etc. But once you've got out of the thermal and you're on glide um, to the next one, actively relax. You know, take a sip of water, eat some food, um, just mentally turn your brain off. And then once you hit the next thermal, then you're back into concentrate mode again. And this, if you find, I think, so some people like limited amount of time that you can fly for. Uh, I think you guys mentioned like four hours is kind of your, your comfortable limit. Relax, actively relax on, um, on the glides when you can, and perhaps you can fly for longer as a result. Maintain energy levels. Um, eating, drinking actually becomes uh, pretty important on the longer flights. It's, you wouldn't necessarily notice that you're low on blood sugar, but certainly your decision making will become less good. Uh, my friend Adrian Thomas, he keeps a pack of wine gums in his glider, and every time he gets to the top of the thermal, he eats one of these sweets and it keeps him topped up. And that's it, pretty much the summary end for the talk. So don't waste time while you're watching clients. Just cut out all those little inefficiencies and decisions. Don't waste time in weak lift, just go for the strong stuff. Eliminate inefficiencies by being much more active your glider control, using the bar more to control pitch particularly. And then we'll take a sort of holistic view of the flight. How is what matters is average speed and average climbs in thermals. How can I use the overall flow of air and the evolution of the day uh, to my advantage? And that <coughs> is how you fly fast for big XC and competitions. Applause. <laughs>